Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this talk on human trafficking. Um, and I would like to kind of give a warning that there may be some content that feels triggering. So I encourage you, if you do feel triggered by any of the contact, content, um, do whatever it is that you need to do for self-care, whether that is to step away from this talk, um, to reach out for some additional support, I encourage you to do so. I do believe that education is the key to helping reduce the victims uh, of this crime. And so I, I hope you'll walk away from this talk with a better understanding of what human trafficking looks like, who are our most vulnerable populations at risk of being exploited, and other ways that we can support if you expect someone is a victim of this crime. So I often ask people, um, what comes to mind when considering human trafficking? And many times, um, you know, we may have all kinds of ideas, but typically when we think of human trafficking, for most people, it's thinking of something that happens to people we don't know in places we don't go. Um, and that is very far from the truth of what the reality looks like. Globally, there are 24.9 million people being trafficked. Uh, this could be domestic servitude or labor, organ trafficking, or sex trafficking. Uh, and sex trafficking will be uh, take up the majority of the conversation today, uh, but we will touch on some of these other forms of trafficking before we move on to that. So domestic servitude or labor can look like forced marriages, um, mail order brides, inherited widows. When we're talking about labor trafficking, we're typically talking about um, employment opportunities. So people coming from impoverished countries to a richer country in hopes of securing a better life for themselves and their families. Many times um, the recruiters give the impression that not only will they have an opportunity to advance financially, it will be an opportunity to see other countries, to maybe learn the language, to get uh, additional educational opportunities. But when they arrive in the destination country, uh, what they walk into is quite different than what they're promised. And Canada is involved in this type of trafficking as the richer country. We've seen this recently as 2020, um, workers coming to work in agriculture, reporting inadequate housing, um, unfair pay, excessive work hours that are not in line with our labor laws. Um, news around uh, Leamington workers, which is, is local to the area that I'm in, um, reported not having adequate living space, uh, adequate PPE or hygiene, um, uh, hygiene necessities available to protect themselves from COVID-19. Many of these workers became ill and others died. These workers have very little recourse against this abuse if they are to report any of the abusive work conditions, typically they are immediately sent back to their home country and blacklisted from ever working in Canada again. So ultimately the choice is helping to support your family, um, climb out of extreme poverty or tolerate abusive work conditions. And that really is no choice at all. Organ trafficking is something we don't hear very much about in Canada, but that's not because Canada is uninvolved in organ trafficking. Um, when we look at organ trafficking, Canadians are involved in something called transplant tourism. Uh, we know that in countries like Canada, 
the wait list for organ transplant is only growing longer every day. Uh, and many people die waiting uh, to receive organs from a donor. When participating in transplant tourism, Canadians are going to other more impoverished countries uh, where organs are harvested from people there, um, sometimes by choice and sometimes not. Even when a person chooses to allow to have their organs harvested, they are typically promised large sums of money, which they receive little to none of. Uh, the majority of the money are going to the uh, people exploiting them, the traffickers themselves. There is little care uh, or any aftercare for these people for the kind of conditions uh, that the organs are harvested in. Uh, and many have lost their lives and, and are no farther ahead in being able to survive or help their families survive. And finally, our last topic, uh, sex trafficking. And again, that will be the main focus of today's workshops. So when we consider these different types of trafficking, we can look at all of these things and say, wait a minute, um, you know, we have people that come to a country and secure good work. Maybe they um, have a specialized skill and they do quite well for themselves and, and live in great conditions. We have organ donor cards where we can voluntarily give our organs. And we have people who choose to do uh, some level of sex work. So what is the difference uh, between these things and trafficking? So all trafficking are made possible by a combination of um, one or all of the following. So when we look at fraud, uh, that will include false promises regarding um, work, wages, uh, working conditions, love, marriage, nature of a relationship. When we look at threats, that would be um, either implicitly or explicitly conveying the message that some harm will come to uh, an individual or people or things that they love, dependent on whether they do or don't do something. Deception is the act of causing someone to accept uh, as true or valid what is um, untrue or invalid. And when we look at coercion, um, that could be things like uh, document confiscation or um, shame and fear inducing threats, um, potentially to, to share information with others. So there was a gentleman called Albert D. Vitamin, and he was a social scientist who worked for the US military and was trying to figure out why the uh, prisoners of war we were cooperating uh, with the enemy. And he had come up with uh, three things that were needed to um, have a hold over someone to psychologically coerce or uh, break a person. And those three things were dependency, stability, and dread. And he came up with this chronological chart of methods that were guaranteed to break a person. And so we'll come back to some of these concepts, but just to go over them now, the first is isolation, then monopolization of perception. Third is humiliation and degradation. The fourth is exhaustion, then threats, occasional indulgences, demonstrating omnipotence, and enforcing trivial demands. 
So we see this same strategy often used in cases of domestic violence, as well in um, getting an upper hand to exploit a person um, to be trafficked. And so, you know, when we think of this chart that Biderman came up with, studying soldiers and prisoners of war, these were soldiers that were trained and prepared for the situation they were going in. Yet, when these things are done over and over again, they were able to psychologically break them. So when a trafficker is using some of these tactics um, against their victims, the victims many times, um, it is their first time ever coming into an experience like this. So considering the chances a victim might have to um, avoid some of these measures to break a person down when um, soldiers who have been trained for war are unable to avoid it. It kind of gives an idea of um, the unfair advantage of these traffickers who are well-versed in these behaviors. So how do you think people end up being trafficked? And what province in Canada do you think the highest human trafficking rate occurs? So we are going to get into um, how people end up being trafficked a little later on. Um, and as far as the province in Canada, Ontario has the highest rate of human trafficking. And, you know, if we think of it statistically, it might seem to make sense, right? Ontario is a larger province. It has more people. Um, so naturally, the rate of human trafficking would be higher. But there's actually um, a key corridor in a pocket of Ontario for human trafficking. And that key corridor is the 401 Highway. And Durham police have said there is not a hotel or motel along the 401 that has not facilitated human trafficking. And this is for a few reasons. Um, one, uh, it is much uh, easier to remain anonymous, um, much less likely to be detected by police. And it also helps in keeping the victims isolated, right? When we look at that first tactic of uh, Biderman's chart of coercion, uh, hotels without um, a lot of uh, other places around them other than stretches of highway are much easier to keep victims isolated. It's also the second largest money generator in organized crime second only to guns and drugs. And there's a few reasons for this. So um, one reason, it's a resaleable commodity. Uh, when we look at the drug trade, someone may get a shipment of um, pure drugs and they certainly can cut them, use filler and extend their profit margin by, by taking the initial weight and um, making it uh, larger right, having additional volume, where they can make a little more money. But once that drug has been sold, uh, that's it. All the money that can be made uh, from that drug has been made. When we look at human beings, they can be sold over and over and over again. And they are. There's a large profit margin in human trafficking. Um, the average uh, trafficker will make two hundred and fifty to two hundred and eighty thousand dollars off of one girl. When we are looking at organized crime, uh, we know that they are um, uh, exploiting more than one girl. So you times that two hundred and fifty or two hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year again and again. It's an extremely large uh, profit margin and a renewable resource. It's often very difficult to detect and prosecute. Um, and so we'll get into some of the reasons that, that make it more difficult. Um, one of those reasons is trauma bonding, which we'll talk about. 
Um, and we also require, uh, in addition to evidence, um, the victims to testify. And, and as we go through this workshop, we'll have a better understanding on why that is such a challenge. So who is at greatest risk of falling victim to this crime? Our high risk groups are indigenous women. Uh, they are exploited uh, at an exponentially greater rate than other populations. Those who identify as LGBTQ uh, or two-spirit, youth that are involved in the system, foster care, youth that are living on the streets, immigrants, uh, people new to the country, those trapped in a cycle of poverty or addiction, really anyone on the margins of society would be considered high risk. And so outside of our high risk groups, um, who else may be at risk of falling victim to this crime? One would be your next door neighbor, uh, eight plus students, educated women, anyone active on social media, um, people who are isolated or uh, who have experienced previous abuse in their life or complex trauma. There is no one quality that can make someone immune to falling victim of this crime. And as we look at the tactics of the traffickers, I think that will make more sense. Um, Durham police had recorded one of the women they had rescued within the past couple of years was in her late forties and was a teacher. Uh, not the typical profile that most people think of when they uh, think of someone who'd fallen victim to being trafficked. So the average age of women trafficked, and it is majority women, about 96% of trafficking victims are women, although men and boys can be trafficked as well when we look at sex trafficking. Um, but if I am referring to women, it's because that is the majority. So about 25 um, percent of girls in Canada are under the age of 18, whereas globally, the average age range is 13 to 18. 45 percent of women are ages 18 to 24. Okay, but that still is only 70 percent um, when we add those averages up. So there's an additional 30% who fall outside of those ranges. When we look at Hollywood's portrayal of trafficking and how it happens, um, I'm not sure if any of you have seen the movie Taken, uh, but there is a, a young girl who is traveling abroad and she is kidnapped um, and sold to traffickers. And um, that does happen. It's, it's not um, that it doesn't happen, but it certainly is probably the least common way that someone would be um, exposed to trafficking. The reality is quite different, and I think it's really, really important we understand the reality um, so we can educate our youth, people we care about, uh, and, and try and recognize some of the signs of someone at risk. The reality is um, there are gorilla pimps, CEO pimps, Romeo pimps, and familial trafficking. And so we are going to touch on each one of these. Gorilla pimps are traffickers uh, who control their victims almost exclusively through violence. Um, so victims uh, are often introduced to gorilla pimps. Um, either they meet them randomly uh, at a club, uh, maybe through a friend, but they are often drugged, raped, and beaten. Uh, and that is the tools that the trafficker uses to break the person and exert control. CEO pimps, um, they 
perceive themselves as operating like a businessman. They use business strategies to manipulate victims. So um, it may be young people who want to be models or people uh, wanting to break into the entertainment industry, um, young people on their own. And each victim is an expense or an asset. So typically they prefer um, uh, victims who are more stable with fewer emotional needs. As the emotional needs increase or things that are considered liability, like a um, obvious uh, addiction, that becomes a um, liability as opposed to an asset when looking at it from a business model. They may put ads in the newspaper, uh, models wanted, no experience required, and they may initially secure legitimate work for the victims uh, with the ultimate goal uh, is sexual exploitation. Familial trafficking, I think, is especially difficult for people to wrap their head around. Um, and it isn't just parents selling children. So this could be any member of the family, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, um, selling other members of the family. And according to Counter Trafficking Data Collaborative, that 58% of children trafficked uh, are trafficked for sexual exploitation. So the other 62 would be things like labor trafficking. 34 of the 58% are those uh, children trafficked that are facilitated by a family member. Um, and I think that is stunning uh, for most people. Uh, families are there to uh, protect children um, when we imagine a healthy family dynamic. And so that, that 34 of 58% of children that are sexually exploited are exploited by their family um, is staggering. And they are especially difficult to detect because they often uh, work in networks. Uh, it's usually um, undercover work that exposes these networks. I'm sorry, correction on my my math there, um, the remaining 42% from the 58 would be uh, trafficked for labor purposes. Lastly, looking at a Romeo pimp, and I do want to say, you know, going back to the gorilla pimp, we'll, we'll discuss the Romeo pimp, but any of these could start out as one and uh, switch to a gorilla pimp. So a Romeo pimp, um, and, and this is probably the most common way that young people are exploited today, uh, also known as the boyfriend pimp. And they will present as a romantic interest. Um, so these pimps, um, there really isn't too many places off limits. They may be nearby high schools. They may be at shopping malls, definitely on social media. Um, there really isn't any place that they can't um, seek out a victim. And they operate by trying to make the victim fall in love with them. So manipulating emotions through a psychological process to eventually break the person down and gain control. So when I talk about they present as a romantic interest, um, this is not just a typical um, flirty relationship presenting in that way. I'm talking about the, the best, most unbelievable, blow your mind, how did I ever get so lucky kind of romantic interest. Um, and for a young girl, especially a young girl who may be experiencing um, awkwardness or that that um, desire to have a sense of belonging of her teenage years, maybe a young girl who's having conflict with her family or struggling with peers at school. This kind of person walking into your life could certainly seem like the answer to everything that's been missing. So unmet needs 
um, make people much more vulnerable. Um, and I, in React, um, Tim Fletcher talks about the 12 needs. And these are, uh, a few of these things are a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, um, feeling nurtured, feeling loved unconditionally, right? All of these things that are these inherent longings within all of us. And if for whatever reason, um, these needs are not met consistently throughout our lifetime, that longing persists and we are more likely to accept counterfeit measures um, to meet those needs than we would be if maybe they were being met in a healthier way. And this makes a person much more vulnerable. So when we talked about our high risk group, um, when we talked about kids on the streets or kids in foster care, we could certainly imagine there would be a lot of unmet needs um, happening, right? History of abuse, that changes the way the brain functions and the brain structure and all of these different layers of vulnerability that add one on top of the other um, that make oftentimes for these, these people who are further trying to abuse and exploit others, it makes them a prime candidate. And so, Aside from food, water, and shelter, we talked about acceptance or having a sense of belonging, a sense of intimacy, and feeling loved. And these traffickers will provide these needs in abundance. So when we talked about children on the street, um, food, water, and shelter would probably be first priority, and the trafficker will provide that from a youth who is maybe feeling ostracized from her peers or, or maybe not in a, a cool group and, and feeling rejected and wanting to fit in, that acceptance and belonging will come from that trafficker. Feeling loved, um, they don't call them Romeo pimps for nothing, right? And that sense of intimacy, uh, it is pseudo intimacy, but um, for the victim, feels incredibly real. So oftentimes, uh, people involved in trafficking it can refer, be referred to as the game or the life. And there are uh, a set uh, procedural um, kind of set of steps that traffickers will typically run through. And they can take anywhere from days to weeks to months and even years. So the first step is the recruiting or luring process. That would be followed by grooming. Then comes in the coercion. And then finally, exploitation. And these are very subtle changes. Um, you know, people don't um, get involved in trafficking typically by meeting someone um, and it goes from great to bad overnight. Um, it is difficult to detect, especially with traffickers that are well-versed in this game. So when luring a victim, um, the trafficker will love bomb that victim, lavishing them with love, attention, gifts, compliments, right? Maybe gifts that were way beyond their means um, to ever have on their own. Um, and we can imagine that all of those things would make a person feel incredibly special, right? When when a, a girl who maybe has some insecurity uh, or, or low self-esteem being told how beautiful they are, um, are just showered with love and, and made to feel like this guy that they've just met is in awe of them and everything they do. Um, the constant attention, the, the beautiful gifts that, um, you know, not only the, the thought of, oh, this person is so thoughtful, but again, oftentimes gifts that are way beyond uh, the victim's means. They will always be there to answer the call from the victim. So uh, the victim starts to feel like this is one person who will always be there for me. When, when someone else isn't answering or someone else doesn't understand, 
Um, I know I can count on this person. The trafficker will express complete understanding um, and support on the victim's position on a variety of topics. So if the victim is, is struggling with their caregiver's mom or dad or someone else in the family, well, yes, then the trafficker will support. You are right, mom or dad or whoever else is completely unreasonable. How can they treat you like that? Um, they don't realize how amazing you are. This is so unfair. They'll also take note of who the victim loves and who the victim has a conflict with. And um, this, again, can seem very um, wonderful to the victim because this, this attentive ear and someone who really um, kind of sees them. And um, this is all an effort that to take control later on. So this information will be used later on against the victim. And um, they do not see that coming at all. This all seems like um, this person is connected, this person is interested, they care about uh, these things, they you know, support me and the people I have conflict with, and um, it, it certainly is quite different than it appears to the victim. Through the grooming process, the trafficker is going to deepen that emotional connection. Um, and oftentimes it comes at the expense of alienating other emotional connections that the victim has, and it helps to create that isolation. They will be incredibly romantic and affectionate. Um, any kind of intimacy will feel extremely tender and passionate and almost like something out of uh, movies or a fairy tale. Um, very expensive vacations and gifts. So again, feeling like it's some kind of Cinderella story. And promises for a future together. And this is critical, okay? The trafficker has to get across that this life that they are living together, that is their future. Um, to get married, to have children, to create and continue this dream life. So not only as the person being exploited, am I feeling like, wow, this is a dream come true. I am so crazy about this person. And not only that, but they are crazy about me and they want to build this life with me. So it reinforces all of those um, incredible feelings. And, and gives a person a real vision of what their future is going to look like. Once that's been secured, um, and again, the timeline may vary, but once the, the victim is at a point of feeling secure and safe in this relationship, right, and pretty confident about who this person is, uh, how much they are loved and what their future is going to look like, then it's time to start the coercion and manipulation. Um, so the trafficker will start to play mind games. They'll withdraw their love. And that keeps the victim on edge. So if you are someone who has had this incredible fairy tale romance where you have felt loved beyond anything you've ever known, you have felt seen and understood in a way that you never have. And then all of a sudden, the secure, wonderful, warm, perfect love story, the love is withdrawn. It's very, very destabilizing. And uh, the victim is going to want to go to whatever lengths to get back that love. Um, they will uh, intermittently give it back, take it away, give it back, take it away. And it creates um, a real sense of walking on eggshells and all this certainty and, and wonderful feeling now has been shaken. And it's uh, the victim becomes very fearful that they will lose this incredible love that they found and oftentimes um, starts to blame themselves when the love is withdrawn. The trafficker will often push sexual boundaries. Um, and this starts to get the victim comfortable with going beyond 
um, what they are used to or what their comfort level is sexually. And again, um, you know, they've had the instability of that love being withdrawn. They want to hang on to this person uh, and keep the love alive. And oftentimes feeling um, like they are willing to push their sexual boundaries uh, is part of that. The trafficker will also give monetary rewards after those sexual boundaries have been pushed. So maybe not um, explicitly handing over money, but things like taking the victim on a huge shopping spree, uh, rewarding them with something that they've wanted for a long time. And it creates that link between sex, money, sex, money, transactional. And it starts to build kind of that neural pathway where those two things are related with each other. And it becomes quite normal and comfortable that those things are connected. Finally, when reaching the exploitation uh, phase, the self-esteem is typically completely broken. There has been numerous cycles of withdrawing love, returning love, right? So those occasional indulgences, that, that love that was so secure becomes one of those occasional indulgences. And the victim is, is um, spinning their self in circles to try and get that wonderful love they first experienced back. Uh, and we see this in, in all kinds of domestic abusive relationships as well. And all their validation comes from the pimp. So when the pimp is happy with them and uh, showing them love, that is where all their validation comes from. So the exploitation may initially be presented as a very short-term solution and uh, may not start directly as an exchange of sex for money. Um, it may be um, presented as, you know what, I've, I've ran into this money problem. Uh, I know this sounds crazy, but have you ever thought of going to a strip club? It wouldn't be forever. It's a short-term solution, and we can have that future we dreamed about. You know you love me. You know, I love you. You're coming home to me. So none of this other stuff matters. It doesn't matter if other guys are touching you. We know we love each other. And this is for our future. So going back to that vision that was created, right, where they're both in this together to create this future that that really um, is a mirage created by the end. They may also normalize the situation using other women under the pimp's control, creating almost a familial environment, right? And um, it may seem that, you know, it would be an extreme thing to be normalized, that how is that possible? Um, and I'll give an example that, that doesn't, it seems, you know, well, that's totally different, but in reality, it isn't. Uh, we can become used to things um, that we were never used to quite easily um, with repetition over time and reinforcement. When I think back to COVID-19 when it began and um, when we started wearing masks out in public or out in the store, I remember the first store I went to wearing a mask. And I remember how strange it felt and how self-conscious and how aware I was. With repetition, and as all the people around me were doing the same thing, uh, it became normalized. And so normalized that sometimes I'd go home and forget I had a mask on and, and would be wearing it around the house, right? So something that felt so foreign and something where I was so self-conscious and so aware. Um, with repetition, people around me doing the same thing um, and um, continuing to do it again and again. Uh, it became second nature, and it is the same idea. Then uh, we can also get into threats of exposure. So all of that information gathering of who the victim loves, who is important to the victim, uh, can be used. You know, do you want your family to find out about this? What you've been doing? I have pictures. I have information. Um, 
I, you know, know your former employers. I know all the people at your school. Do you want all this going out to everyone? And, you know, we've heard more and more about sextortion um, and the power that that has over people, right? So that fear of the shame, um, the trafficker knows who is important um, to the victim and that information is utilized for their benefit to help hold control. So, you know, there, there comes a time um, where maybe the girls being trafficked have some freedom of movement, right? Um, so people start to think, well, why not just get help? If you don't want to do this, you know, why not get some help? You're not physically tied down or locked in a room. And then there's a number of reasons as to why people don't reach out for help. So total reliance on the trafficker, right? Um, the trafficker uh, may have uh, replaced the phone. Often that's very common tactic is replace the phone. Um, so any calls, texts, anything going out, the trafficker has access to. Um, they may have all of the money, um, all of the, the food, the access to everything, and they are completely dependent on that trafficker. Might be lack of trust. And so over time, without monopolization of perception, victims often come to believe that the trafficker is the only person that they can trust. Victims battle with a feeling of hopelessness, right? So starting to think, how do I start all over again? And, you know, I, I don't know what the resources are. Um, there have been threats made against me and my family. Um, how could I even get out of this? Stigma and discrimination. Um, so, you know, as we're, we're learning more, services, you know, certainly come a long way and are improving. Um, but there are service providers that a, a victim may uh, sense they experience judgment from, and that fear can keep someone from going forward. Um, they may be fearful of judgment from community members or family, uh, especially if, if family or, or friends had maybe said, hey, I don't know about this guy in the beginning, and they had and to close those people off thinking, no, they're wrong. This, this guy is great and he understands me. Um, so there's that fear of judgment there. Not seeing themselves as a victim. Um, and so they may not understand that they have been trafficked, right? And still see their trafficker as a person they love, as their boyfriend, as a person who loves them. Um, and have formed a, a trauma bond with their trafficker. Previous and current trauma. So if if someone has experienced um, various forms of trauma throughout their life, including poverty or neglect or abuse, um, and the abuse continues, uh, that really affects our worldview, our view of ourself. Um, and can certainly have an impact on mental health, which can be a huge barrier in coming forward. Isolation. Um, we know that um, the victims are very isolated. There's not a lot of opportunity uh, outside of interactions with um, people who are procuring um, services from the pimps or from other people under the pimps control, as well as a lack of support. So really not even knowing where to go in the community, where they begin, where is safe. A lot of times there is a huge fear around law enforcement um, and fear that they will get in trouble themselves, uh, which is not true, um, but that fear is very powerful. So what are some of the barriers? Um, you know, even, even if a person is to come forward, uh, it is 
really difficult, um, even if cases are identified and, and charges are laid, there are additional challenges to successful prosecution. So many times it will defend, depend on a victim's testimony, and they may be seen as less credible for some of the same reasons that make them more vulnerable. So things like substance misuse, mental illness, um, and, you know, aside from that, if even if they are willing to go forward, traumatic memories are stored in a very fragmented way. Um, they are not stored linear, where we can say from beginning to end. Um, they are stored fragmented, and that is not ideal for testimony in a court of law. So a lot of barriers to being able to uh, bring justice from the legal system to people that have been victimized. When supporting a, a person who you suspect or, or who has identified as a person who's been trafficked, um, understand that some of the other barriers, um, there is an emotional attachment to this trafficker, right? If, if there's been a Romeo pimp, the, even though the relationship was fraudulent coming at them, what they experienced was incredibly real. So all of those feelings of love and intimacy and tenderness are real experiences and memories stored of that person. So it would be very difficult then um, to be able to separate them. So if you imagine any relationship in your life um, any romantic relationship or someone you love. And someone came up to you today and said, you know, everything you experienced, that was all a lie. None of it was real. And so all of those moments of tenderness of intimacy that you've experienced, I want you to imagine how difficult it would be to just accept what that person said as truth. Right. And even in our heads, we may think, well, it's different. My person, you know, the person I'm with hasn't had me um, sleep with anyone else or hasn't, um, you know, done ABC, whatever you want to list there. It is no different. That emotional connection is the same. And as we touched on, oftentimes um, victims don't realize what happened to them and um, still believe their emotional experience over um, some of the facts of, of what happened. Even if they approach the idea that some of those facts may be true, there's a tendency to revert back to that love story because that is much easier to bear that, you know, this is all a misunderstanding. I wasn't trafficked. This person loves me. All of those things I experienced were real. And somehow this is, you know, I'm an exception. And this is was just the circumstances of our relationship. This was a, a temporary measure. We are going to have this future together. Um, it'd be much less painful to um, have that as the experience than what you would be facing, um, trying to wrap your head around all of that was untrue, it was all with an agenda, and you had been trafficked. Um, and so allowing people that time they need, um, they may go back and forth before they are able to break free. Um, and, and so understanding oftentimes that's part of the process uh, and how difficult that would be to come to accept as reality. So how can we help? If we um, know someone who has disclosed that they have been trafficked um, or suspect that someone is at risk, if you are a care provider and you're offering trauma-informed care, you are first going to provide them with a safe and welcoming environment. And so we want to be um, mindful of potential triggers, okay? And some of those are feeling a lack of control or unexpected change, um, 
feeling vulnerable or fright, frightened or attacked. And, you know, in with the most pure efforts, we may want to take control of the situation um, and say, this is what has to be done. And we're going to do this and then this, and this guy's going down. And however you feel like you are taking care of that person, when we take control and don't let them lead uh, to their own resolution, we are at risk of re-traumatizing someone. So being very respectful of their own journey, what their capacity is, and what their choices are, um, which may be different than um, what we would hope their choices would be. So be aware of those behaviors, not to disempower the individual. Be patient and kind, okay? Um, compassionate and empathetic and respectful. And, and if that person is going back to their trafficker and it feels like all of these facts are in your face and this guy has beaten you and he has sold you and, um, you know, and it just seems so frustrating because you're wanting this person to break free, um, you know, there may be a tendency to want to say, is this what you want? You know, this guy has done this and this. Um, again, that will only further alienate. The person will feel attacked. Um, so understanding that patience, that empathy, that respect is incredibly important. Whether or not we agree or disagree with what their choices are. Okay, and offering that consistency because it takes time to build trust under the best of circumstances. Um, and after a breach of trust that was so grievous that this person had experienced, uh, really give some grace for the amount of time it will take to rebuild that trust. If you are in the um, Windsor, Ontario area, um, we have Windsor Essex Counter Ex Exploitation Network, um, and they help victims come out of human trafficking. Majority of um, major cities uh, and even smaller cities have groups that specialize in this area. Um, and so getting to a safe space, um, making sure that you know the information for your own local area that you may be able to pass on in a safe way. Uh, to someone who is at risk or who is disclosed to you. So I thank you so much um, for the willingness to increase your understanding of human trafficking uh, and, and really um, hope you have a better understanding of, of why education is so critical, um, that it is an especially difficult crime to stop in progress when we are looking at the Romeo pimps, there is no crime against being someone's boyfriend. Um, and so it isn't until after the crime has been committed that there is an opportunity to stop if it goes that far. Whereas when we look at any other crime, um, there's an opportunity to stop it in progress, right? If you look at bank robbing, uh, you know, that crime could be stopped before the bank is actually robbed. Whereas with human trafficking and the tactics used by pimps, the opportunity to stop it um, isn't until after the crime has occurred. So if we can educate ourselves, educate our youth as to what are some of the things to watch for and what are some of the supports, if they're unsure or they have any questions, I truly believe that's our best defense. Thank you so much again. Um, appreciate your time and appreciate you being part of the solution.